Good morning. My name is Bruce Cotts, and these are the five Buddhist remembrances for contemplation from the Pali Canon. One, I am of the nature to grow old. There is no way to escape growing old. Two, I am of the nature to have ill health. There is no way to escape having ill health. Three, I am of the nature to die. There is no way to escape death. Four, all that is dear to me and everyone I love are of the nature to change. There is no way to escape being separated from them. Five, my actions are my only true belongings. I cannot escape the consequences of my actions. My actions are the ground upon which I stand. These are the facts. The way things are, are the way things are. The facts don't change, but your attitude towards those facts can change. I'd like to give some examples from my own life. Everything I know and everything I think about myself in the world is based on a mythology that either I have either been told or developed myself. Everything. That's not all bad. It could be a survival mechanism. For example, I don't have to touch a hot stove to believe that the fact that it is painful. We have been told that it is painful, and I believe it. If I drink enough poison, the fact is that I'm going to die. I don't have to experience it. I've accepted it into my mythology or belief system. I smoked for over 40 years. When I started smoking, nine out of 10 doctors recommended camel cigarettes. The mythology was that smoking was actually good for you and calmed your nerves and that it was, and it was what successful people did. Since then, we have found new facts and we now know that smoking destroys your lungs, among other things. So, so the mythology is changing. Unfortunately for me, it was not soon enough. I was on oxygen for a couple of years because of end stage COPD caused by smoking. And it was assumed that I would die within a very short time. However, I found new facts. It was possible to have lung transplants, which I did a little over 12 years ago. And I now walk between 10 and 15 miles a week without being short of breath. I did this by challenging the mythology that I had previously, previously accepted. <clears throat> Where I run into trouble though is that sometimes I confuse mythology with fact which leads to all kinds of incorrect assumptions, such as I am superior, or I am inferior, or I'm incapable, or that I am doomed to be unhappy. The facts of my life are that I am 79 years old and have had a great deal of happiness as well as trauma in my life. My youngest daughter died as an infant in 1968. My oldest daughter died from suicide in 1988. My wonderful wife and best friend for 25 years died suddenly and unexpectedly in 2016. My only son died from the effects of alcoholism in 2018. And my beautiful, intelligent, surviving daughter is struggling with the effects of all these trauma, all of which I am powerless over, even though I have been in recovery for myself for over 30 years. Those are the facts any of which I could develop into a mythology of despair, which I did after my oldest daughter's suicide. I came very close to drinking myself to death. Through therapy and later through Buddhist teachings and meditation, I found that I could change the mythology. Some of the main tools I use is meta meditation and calm abiding meditation. The facts stayed the same, by my, but my interpretation of the facts changed. I changed the mythology of tragedy to a mythology of gratitude. Gratitude for all the gifts that these loved ones were and still are in my life. I look at these gifts that they have given me instead of the pain of their losses. My eight and a half month old daughter who died from sudden infant death syndrome was a laughing, happy, bright ray of sunshine who never knew suffering. My oldest daughter was one of the most loving, caring, and kind people I have ever met, but bipolar disorder made her life unbearable. My wife was also my greatest teacher, 
and was filled with grace and beauty that I can only imitate. My son was brilliant beyond words, and he de demonstrated great perseverance and never gave up on recovery. But the disease of alcoholism proved itself to be fatal. The facts didn't change, but my attitude did. My pain was lessened and my happiness increased. I found that it was further increased if I shared my insights with others who were experiencing similar situations. I believe that no matter how desperate the situation, the seeds and causes of happiness are also always present. We need to look for them and change our myths from despair to happiness and contentment. Many Buddhist teachings tell us that we can increase our own happiness by increasing the happiness of others. That is still only a myth until we put it into practice or realized it, that is, make it real. It then ceases to be myth and becomes a fact. Pain and suffering are an inevitable part of living, but misery is only an option that we choose, either by inattention or inaction. If I am unhappy or discontented, I ask myself during my meditation sessions, what is causing my suffering? Is it based on a false, myth false mythology? Is it real? Do I really want to be happy? What in my thinking can be changed? I would like to close my comments with a Buddhist blessing. May you be happy. May you be healthy. May you be free from pain and suffering. May you be loving and kind and at peace. Thank you, Bruce. My readings on Buddhism are in the Theravada tradition that is practiced as the dominant religion in Southeast Asia in the countries of Cambodia, Laos, Sri Lanka, Thailand, and Myanmar, previously Burma. I practice Vipassana meditation or insight meditation as it's known in the West. Vipassana means to see things as they really are. Uh, young, dissatisfied, disillusioned Westerners during the 1960s and 1970s had traveled to the Far East looking for answers. Many of these searchers had been Peace Corps volunteers. When they returned, they shared their Buddhist experiences with the West. Jack Cornfield was a Theravada monk in the forests of Thailand and had studied under several legendary masters, including Ajahn Shah. In 1975, he founded the Insight Meditation Society in Barrie, Massachusetts with Joseph Goldstein and Susan Salzberg. In 1988, Jack Cornfield and other Vipassana teachers, including Sylvia Bornstein, then founded the Spirit Rock Insight Meditation Center in Woodacre, California. Much of the popularity of the Buddhist message today in the West is as a result of the experiences these Buddhist teachers brought back from their travels several decades ago. My interest in Buddhism actually began as a curiosity. My first observations were those of the Dalai Lama photos and videos of Buddhist monks, and statues and sketches of a smiling and often rotund Buddha sitting cross-legged in, in the lotus position. My picture actually of Buddhism was of contentment and happiness. Since I was having some difficulties at the time, I was attracted to this. This was 2009, the recession of 2009. The company I'd worked for in Tampa had closed its office and I was out of work. Job prospects were few. I was surviving, but depleting my savings and disposable income. I had the time to read and study while also trying to get back on solid economic footing. I started my Buddhist practice actually listening to a wonderful audio tape entitled The Inner Art of Meditation, a beginner's course by Jack Cornfield, recorded at one of his retreats. As Jack suggested, I focused my attention meditating on the breath. I initially had a lot of difficulty. My mind was undisciplined. Thoughts were numerous and scattered. After practicing for a while, my concentration improved and I was able to remain on the breath much longer. I noticed that not only did my concentration and mindfulness improve while meditating, as a result, awareness and focus improved 
outside of meditation in my everyday life as well. I found that on my walks, particularly, I was more in tune with my surroundings, even felt colors became more vivid. I also believe that the concentration I acquired while meditating made me a better listener when talking to someone one-on-one. -on -one. I, was, I was pleased. I read books and listened to audio tapes and CDs on Buddhism. I practiced without a personal teacher, although a personal teacher would have been very helpful. I continued meditating. My meditation changed though. Things started showing up. When I was a youngster, I knew I had issues. I was very shy and introverted, worried a lot, and was afraid of standing out. Other children referred to me as a worry wart, and I was. When my teacher called on me or I had to stand up in class, I had so much fear and panic that my face would turn bright red. As a child, I never heard the word anxiety. However, I now know that anxiety has affected me my entire life. With my practice, I became aware of liabilities. In addition to worry and fear, I often became angry, had a short fuse, took things personally, overreacted, was judgmental and opinionated, and had a negative outlook. Relationships suffered. These were not the pleasant thoughts I was looking for in meditation. I was raised in a different era in the 1950s and 1960s. You did not focus on your emotions and feelings or obstacles like selfishness and greed. If you had unpleasant feelings, you tried not to think of them. In Buddhism Vipassana, however, you see things as they really are without judgment. You practice being mindful all the time. The more I read on Buddhism, the more I understood that pleasant feelings do not bring happiness. All feelings, pleasant as well as unpleasant, are impermanent. They change, they do not last. In Buddhism, having pleasant feelings is not the objective. According to Buddha though, there is no higher happiness than peace. Peace is the goal. All experiences are teaching opportunities and that includes both the pleasant and the unpleasant. I looked at my limitations in relationship to Buddha's noble truths that there's dukkha, the Buddhist word for unsatisfactoriness or suffering, but there's also a Buddhist path to end this dissatisfaction. RAIN, the acronym R-A-I-N, is also a Buddhist mindfulness tool to cope with hardship adapted by Tara Brock, an American Buddhist psychologist and Vipassana teacher. R, recognize. I recognize my feelings of fear, worry, nervousness, and my nature of becoming easily overwhelmed. A, allow. I take a pause and allow my fears to be there just as they are. I investigate. I investigate with kindness. I investigate the changes occurring in my body when I'm anxious, the tightness in my throat and chest, the flushness in my face. I investigate my beliefs. I was failing in some way. I was falling short. I investigate my needs, my need for comfort and reinforcement from a caring voice. N non-identification and nurture. These painful thoughts and feelings are not me. Everything's gonna be all right. I discovered by recognizing and examining my fears, they lose their power. Social justice has been a concern of mine. Our UUC community, community has helped me greatly in this regard. Pima Chodron, an American Tibetan Buddhist ordained nun, offered a teaching in her article entitled Smile at Fear in the most recent July issue of Lion's Roar magazine. Pima Chodron said, and when meditation practice has helped us to be honest and courageous enough to know ourselves in a deep way, we can begin to extend out and help others 
because the things outside of us that appear threatening can be worked with far more sanely and humanly when we've started to make an honest relationship with the fear within. I'm still anxious at times, it's okay. I try to be more mindful and take a pause before I react, to not take things so personally, to be less judgmental and a little more understanding when difficulties arise. Buddhism would say to handle difficult situations with equanimity. The Dalai Lama said, try to be at peace with yourself and help others share that peace. I've tried to do that here this morning. Thank you, namaste. Thanks, Doug and Bruce, and good morning. Um, I think the best um, the use of our short time together this morning is to share with you the single most important practice I know of that can help each of us enhance, enrich, and enliven our daily lives. And the subject is mindfulness, probably already familiar to many of you. Mindfulness is a very down-to-earth practice in which we pay closer attention only to this present experience, regardless of what we happen to be doing at the time. We don't think about anything, most especially we don't think about our pasts or futures. Now, to be more present to our daily experience sounds simple enough. But we're easily bored by and distracted from the ordinary routines of our typical days. So we just check out, lost in thought, because we think our thoughts must be more interesting, entertaining, and creative than employing emptying the garbage or running errands one more time again. However, research by the National Science Foundation reveals that losing ourselves in thought is really a losing proposition. They found that we generate at least 6,000 thoughts, mostly unconscious, a day, and that 80% of our thoughts are negative, and most astounding that 90% of those thoughts we generate today are exactly like we generated yesterday. So Sam Harris, an atheist and neuroscientist and Buddhist meditator, <laughs> describes his own interior thought waterfall as trivial, tedious, relentless, and redundant, and says it's like being kidnapped by the most boring person on the planet for life. And when we exchange our present experiences for obsessive compulsive thinking, it turns out we create a far more serious problem than just wasting our time. We also are wasting our lives, which are only available to us during our present moment since our pasts are gone, our futures are a guess, and our fantasies are make-believe. John Kabat-Zinn, a Buddhist meditator and the foremost teacher of secular mindfulness in this hemisphere, summarizes our existential dilemma succinctly. He writes, we need to practice being more present as if our very lives depend upon it. So during a recent dental appointment, the dentist interrupted his procedure to kindly ask me how I was doing. And without thinking, I found myself smiling and assuring him that, in fact, I'm having the time of my life. And just then, that moment was my life, my whole life, really. And it was lovely and quiet and comfortable, resting in the devoted care of another. And what more could I possibly want? The Vietnamese Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh 
who was the teacher of my teacher, said this. He said, if while washing the dishes, we think only of the cup of tea that awaits us, we're incapable of realizing the miracle of life while we're standing at the sink. And if we can't find joy and peace in this present moment, how can we live the future when drinking the tea has become the present? This propensity to play our lives forward has been a lifelong challenge for me. My to-do list summons me forth to begin thinking about my next appointment and the next instead of remaining present to this event with these people in front of me now. Now, we've all experienced lots and lots of present moments in our lives in the midst of great joy or sorrow often, and even enjoyed peak experiences as well, perhaps while visiting a novel place or in a fresh circumstance. But I'd like to focus on choosing to expand and alive our present experiences exponentially, a few at a time, during our most ordinary and routine moments as well. This snippet is from a writer in a very different context than mindfulness. And he says that washing dishes reminds me that the ordinary isn't the enemy. The ordinary is the bedrock upon which all the rest of experience ebbs and flows. And since washing the dishes has come up again, it may be time to go into the kitchen. And actually, when I volunteer or am volunteered for to wash a lot of dishes, after say a UU event or a large family gathering, up to my elbows in soapy, dirty, hot water and dirty pots and pans stacked up to my ears, these moments feel very pregnant to me. Well-fed, surrounded by good company, being very useful and very challenged and nowhere else I'd rather be. So how can we retrain ourselves to become more mindfully aware bit by bit in our very ordinary moments? We end up following these very simple steps, usually in roughly this order. To be mindful, we must start by reminding ourselves to do so. And then we need to slow way, way down, really stop long enough to ask two simple questions. What is my body doing and where is my mind right now? And then we stay put until we can open and sink into the present experience long enough to savor its fullness. And then finally, we let ourselves feel this moment in our hearts and in our bodies. Feel what? Feel more alive, of course. And these moments of feeling more alive are also portals to other more important, deeper feelings as well. For example, there may be moments of transformation. Standing in line at the grocery store at their busiest hour, I watch my boredom and impatience melt by simply transferring my attention to the energy coursing through the palms of my hand. Closing my eyes to better hear the din of all those voices immersed in the sea of life, more life or moments of being more present to others, finally together again with covenantal brothers and sisters. I'm touched by the intimacy bred from our gradual increasing vulnerability 
and deeper listening as we strengthen these familial bounds. Or moments of delight. Every third day or so on her long leash, Chica celebrates the morning sun with a dance, choreographed deep in her doggy jeans, running as fast as she can in figure eights and then in ever widening circles. And she's encouraged and rewarded by my applause of hearty laughter because her moments of delight and celebration are mine. Or moments of quietude in the shade after a rain, weeding the garden and pruning bamboo one at a time. Or moments of wonder, the blood moon, or the dude ebb of an orb spider. On a black night, listening closely in the shadows for the nearly invisible phantom band of hungry coyotes who run through our yard most nights to their hunting grounds in the pond behind the house. Or moments of inspiration while visiting prisons and practicing walking meditation sometimes, we all focus on this footfall going to nowhere, of course. And the inmates teach me again and again because these walls have taught them that life really does exist only in my present moment, like these, as well as in their present moments, there for the rest of their lives. I do hope we agree <clears throat> how more wholehearted engagements with our everyday experience might help us to transform our boredom into curiosity, our routine into surprise, our grief to gratitude, as Bruce has told us, and even sometimes the profane to the sacred. And awakened from our daydreams, we can slowly learn to reclaim our ordinary garden variety moments that we once took for granted and lost. And we'll find that these found moments are often sweet and lovely and sometimes very juicy and not so ordinary after all. I'm mindful just now of George Burns' timeless advice that the secret of a good sermon is to have a good beginning and a good ending and to have the two as close together as possible. And therefore, in this present moment, I wish to thank all of you on behalf of the four of us, including Sue, who chose the perfect medley of music, poetry, and story. And thank you for being here this morning with us in the here and now.